The video you are about to watch will provide the most profound and even shocking description of Israel's war practice in Gaza. And folks, make no mistake, this one's going to be eye-opening. All right, folks, let's get into this one. First of all, I have to tell you, this is going to be a really, really eye-opening video to watch because this interview is absolutely remarkable. Now, I was inspired to make a video of this interview because there is so much to say in between many of the things that you are going to hear in this interview that I think can be very helpful for you to understand and better contextualize all of the issues that are going on. But the other thing is, so few people watched this interview with Jordan Peterson, comparatively speaking, there are so many videos that get watched way more than this one, and I hope making this video will get way more exposure even than what he has on his site because it deserves the exposure. So let me give you some context. This is Jordan Peterson who is having a very, very remarkable interview with a man by the name of John Spencer. Now, for those of you who don't know who John Spencer is, he is literally the foremost authority in the world on urban warfare, and uh, he is considered to be the scholar. He is the go-to guy, literally the guy who's at the top of the food chain when it comes to being a subject matter expert in this, and he very specifically has studied virtually everything there is to know about urban warfare and how it relates to societies and different types of war fronts and so on and so forth. And this guy is not only remarkably articulate, but he has a lot of very sound understanding in the Mideast. And so him and Jordan Peterson have a very candid conversation regarding the subject of what's happening with Israel and Hamas and the war practices that Israel is showing and what's actually going on. And folks, I'm going to tell you, it's astounding. Now, let me tell you how this is going to go. We are going to watch this video together. Now, we are going to start this video at around the 34-minute mark from the original video. By the way, like I say before, I would highly encourage you to go and to watch Jordan's whole video on this. The video is great. He did a great job with the interview. I would love for you all to watch it from the very beginning without any of my commentary. I think that that will be very helpful, especially after you hear my commentary. But I also want to remind everybody that this video is designed for me to provide commentary to. So if you're looking to see an interview uh, uninterrupted, you're not going to find that here. As a matter of fact, it's going to get interrupted quite a bit in areas that I think will be helpful for you to be able to better understand exactly what's going on, why things are happening, and to make some uh, better connections for you. So that's what we're going to do here. I think you're going to really love this video. I think it's going to... Um, uh, open up your eyes to see some things that you've probably never seen before. Uh, I know that it opened up my eyes to see certain facts that I had not yet completely known or been aware of, and it's just remarkable stuff. So with that said, let's jump into the video, and as I said, hold on to the seat of your pants. This is going to be a good one. Well, so let's go back to Hamas. Yes. What do you think the Israeli strategy is at the moment? How is that playing out? Are they being successful? Do you think it's a good strategy? And, and do you think it has a chance at defeating this ideology? I mean, if it's if it's fostered by Iran, okay, I I haven't been able to envision what a pathway to victory for the Israelis looks like. Okay. So tell yeah, me what you absolutely. think about that. Jordan's question off the bat is a is a very, very good question. The one mistake that's being made here in the imposition of this question is not founded in the question itself. It's founded in a very fundamental misunderstanding, for lack of a better term, of how Islamic culture works and how the way these people in Hamas think. Their mindset has nothing to do with some intended goal or purpose other than the destruction of the Jewish state and when you really stop to consider what they sort of want to get out of things, none of it stands on reason. There's a mindset, especially for those of us in the West, that ask a question like this based on what we think is reasonable and sound. But there is nothing reasonable or sound in the way this type of thing works, especially when you are an Islamic fundamentalist. And I want to make myself very, very clear. We saw this for the first time in the United States of America on 9-11, right? You don't. 
there's nothing you can do to stop somebody who is purposefully willing to take themselves out while taking a whole bunch of people out. It's a very different mindset. So that question is a really good question. It's very hard for me to be able to explain why that question is on the wrong premise. But listen to John Spencer's answer. It's actually quite telling, and it's a very good answer, by the way. So I actually got to go visit. You know, I've been into Gaza twice, um, in December in, in Hamas tunnels, and in February with the IDF in Khan Yunus. I interviewed the, the prime minister. I'm like, what are the, your strategic goals you gave to the military? I interviewed the head of the IDF, multiple subordinate commanders. The objectives for Israel, the path to victory, which is always hard to define in war, right? Right, because right. Now, at this point, a we're tricky gonna, problem. There's already people who have said it's a strategic failure for Israel already. And the war's not even known. Yeah. Uh, but I, it is very clear what was the objectives. Number one, bring the hostages home. So of the 240 hostages taken on October 7th, it's a clear war goal to bring them home. Okay. And Israel has brought over half of them home. There's 124 left in Gaza. The other one was to remove Hamas from power and dismantle its military capability. Right. Okay. But then the question is, who exactly is Hamas? How do you distinguish them from the civilians? And what are the... So you said you can respond proportionately, so you're going to remove Hamas's military capacity. But if Hamas is in some ways indistinguishable from the Palestinian civilian population, then how do you know when you've... How do you know when you've won? Right. And yeah. in a manner that's going to matter in the future. And this is a really good question that he's asking because the, you have a big problem. First of all, let me let me give you some stats that might uh, help you to better understand or appreciate why Jordan is asking this question. Um, an overwhelming majority of the Palestinian uh, population that is in Gaza sympathizes with the cause of Hamas. As a matter of fact, if you go to Judea and Samaria, which is uh, sort of under the purview of the Palestinian Authority, who are sworn enemies of Hamas, uh, they, even an overwhelming majority of them, I want to say somewhere around, right around 80%. It's it's some The numbers have kind of been back and forth. They say anywhere from as low as 73% and as high as 82%. But it's somewhere around that, that neighborhood of people, if they were to be able to vote for today, even with Sinwar at the lead, they would vote for Hamas. So it's interesting how when you start talking about the delineation of uh, those that are combatants versus those that aren't, it's hard to tell because people that are combatants in in Gaza, many of them are wearing, you know, uh, everyday citizen clothing. Uh, they don't present themselves to be combatants at first, and then all of a sudden, terrible things happen. Israel has a very difficult time establishing where that demarcation exists, and that's a very tough thing to be able to consider here. And by the way, this is all part of the Islamic fundamentalism. I am a biblical fundamentalist. I believe in the fundamentals of the Bible. If you are an Islamic fundamentalist, you believe in the fundamentals of the Quran, then you're going to believe in deception. You're going to believe in using deception to destroy and overwhelm uh, you know, whoever it is that the Quran tells you to destroy and overwhelm. Let me read to you a portion of the Quran. Again, I've done this many, many times before. This is in 354. It says, So like if you think about the significance of that statement, it basically means that Allah is the chief of deceivers. It's a heavy statement to be making. So this is a very difficult thing. It's, it's, it's like you're holding this, like this slimy thing that's falling out of your hands and you have no idea how to get a hold of it. It's a very difficult issue here. And this is a a profoundly important question. I love this. I love this specificity that most people don't ask. How do you distinguish in a, in a a situation like this where Hamas is using human sacrifice, wearing civilians, there's not a single Hamas military building in Gaza. Right. Right. Not one. Uh, so how do you move forward? I actually want the laws of war upheld. There's actually very clear guidance, even with a non-state actor not wearing a uniform, what classifies as a combatant or non-combatant or as a person partaking in the hostilities. As in you're you're shooting at the IDF. You're a, a, mem- a combatant. Right, a, right. A person that seems hostile. clear, yeah. Now, who's in Hamas? This is actually my visits to the IDF. Like, they have a board, like, walls of every member of Hamas's military, from brigade commander, battalion commander, company commanders, and either exes for killed and captured as they're breaking apart. The goal of dismantling <coughs> a military is never, just like we talked about in the beginning, to destroy all of them. 
mm-hmm. to kill every member of Hamas. It's never been the goal in war. And always after the war, once you remove that power, whether it is the Japanese emperor or Hitler himself, there's still going to be tens yeah, of thousands right. of it. You have to reconcile them. You have to do de-radicalization programs. You have to disarm people. Right. Those are and all, that is possible. It, it's possible, proven, mm-hmm. everything. Right. Worked in Germany, worked in Japan. I can't tell you what that looks like. Yeah, but I'm going to disagree with, with both of them in this to talk about how the fact it's possible to de-radicalize. The difference with Germany and Japan is Germany and Japan were not driven by religious fundamentalist type of uh, assertions, okay? If you're a fundamentalist of the Bible, then yeah, you, you don't have to be de-radicalized because when a Christian is radicalized, they stand for righteousness and truth. And we're not dealing with the type of violence that we're seeing. We're not dealing with the type of things that we're actually witnessing right now in Gaza. But the problem is, is you can't de-radicalize somebody who believes that the ultimate reward for uh, martyrdom is to have your 72 virgins and, and everything else. This is a very difficult problem. You cannot de-radicalize somebody who's been raised their whole life to believe that the, the, the false words that they find in the Quran are actually true. Even though the Quran itself tells them that Allah is the chief of deceivers. You can't de-radicalize that. It's very difficult, by the way. So my point is, is if you take a leader out, it's a vacuum. You'll just, you'll bring another leader into play. I can't tell you what that looks like the day after, but I can tell you it will never even begin to work if Hamas stays in power. Yeah. So the path to victory, step one is remove Hamas from power. Step two is remove its military. And so that, that means targeting those people that are identified in the way that you already described right. Targeting enough of them until until what? Like who who gives up in this situation? Like how would the Israelis know when Hamas is actually being sufficiently defeated? Yeah. So in this case, again, it's measurable. Like it's literally like measures of effectiveness and measures of performance are pretty clear on how okay. do you remove a form from power is when they're the leadership that is the power, right? Just like when if Zelensky would have left Ukraine, it would have went a lot differently, right? Because the leadership is a symbol of the power. And if you if it gets broken apart, then another power can be put in place. And like now that person is in power. Right. We've done we bring our powers with us, right? Invasion of Afghanistan, invasion of Iraq. We brought people with us who said that they would be the new power. Right. That's the challenge of the day after. But from the actual objective of the war, Hamas is still in power. It's not an insurgency, it's not a counter-terrorist campaign. Hamas is a political body ruling Gaza through its now somewhat broken apart units, Mm -hmm. but it's still there. It's still in power and and publicly stating things and negotiating all this stuff. Right. So it's still a recognizable entity. That's right. Yeah. And he's right. So that means in essence, you have to remove that power. If you don't remove that power, then you have a problem. So all of this negotiation that the international community is trying to bring into play does no good because if Hamas still stays in power, you still have the culture of death being embraced. It's the plain and simple truth. Okay. It's not, once it gets to the point where it's not a functioning organization, so even from the political apparatus or the military, it's really definable. Militarily, you say you can destroy a military when it can't do its assigned mission, attack or defend, Mm -hmm. and it can't reconstitute itself. Mm -hmm. That's pretty easy. Politically, you could probably apply the same metric. It can't rule in, in its assigned geographic location. Right now, one of the reasons that you have so many broken apart Hamas members from fighting is because they still think they'll win. Right. Because right. War, so the will hasn't been destroyed. That's right. Why would why would you give up? Your your leadership's still safe in southern Gaza. The message is continue to resist until we till the, the IDF is stopped. This goes back to your question about again. Military strategy is not that complicated as we want to make it. Yes, defeating an ideology is very complicated. From a military strategy, both sides had a grand strategy. I already told you what Hamas is, but they also had a military strategy. Hamas's military strategy was never to defeat the IDF on the field of battle. It's never been. Like you said, they, they actually have a strategy that's based on time for the international community, yeah. namely the United States, like the United States has in almost every one of Israel's wars, to stop the Israel saying, look, I know you have the right to self-defense, whether it's the Six-Day of War, Yom Kippur of War, you name it. Say, I know you have the right to self-defense, 
but you need to stop. Right, right. So that's hence the, hence the protests on American campuses. That's the Hamas strategy working. What he's basically saying is, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll better understand it when I put it this way, is he's saying that Hamas doesn't need to win the war. Hamas doesn't need to uh, respond with overwhelming force and eliminate their enemies. The only thing Hamas needs to do in order to have a profound victory is they need to say they survived. So, so think about it like this. If Sinwar, who's the last remaining kind of bigwig leader of Hamas, is allowed to survive, and he ends up you know, running off into another nation or gets away for a while and comes back into any type of political arena, he will be the god of the Islamic movement in the area of Israel. He will literally be the person who will uh, become a superhero to every single kid. And Hamas will not just win, but Hamas will thrive because of the fact that it survived the attack and was able, they're able to now go back and say, Israel didn't have an effect on us. We got this. So this is why they have to go. This is a very, very important point that he's bringing up. They don't have to win. All they have to do is survive. And that's it. Right, right. Of course, of course. But this is... But, but, so how much of that... All right. So after October 7th and the campus protests emerged and very rapidly, how much of that was a consequence of a strategy that was conscious, that was put in place consciously by Iranian actors or proxies in the aftermath of October 7th? And listen to what he says here. Listen to the, to, the, to the answer to this question. And the question is a very good question. He's saying basically all these college campus protests where they're free, free Palestine, they're doing all that nonsense. How much of this was created by foreign actors? Look what he has to say. This is a pretty telling answer here. And how much of it, how much of it was spontaneous, spontaneous consequence, let's say, of the victim-victimizer narrative? Like to what degree... Has Iran managed to co-opt actors in the West that can organize those sorts of protests? Yeah, um, all organized, all history learned. I mean, I can take you back to battles in which the United States was stopped through that use of social media, Al Jazeera, and others saying they're being they're violating the laws of war. Too many civilians are dying. They're being disproportionate and to stop. But within Israel's context, I mean, I don't want to take away from Yahya Simwar sitting in jail for many, many years thinking of what are we, the weaknesses of Israel? Mm -hmm. It's reliance on the United States. Mm -hmm. It's casualty aversion. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't, you know, IDF, has, the, the, Israel has stopped wars from a very low number of IDF casualties. Hostages. Uh -huh. Of course, uh -huh. I mean, a, a nation that small, a, you know, they've held a single guy for years and gotten thousands of prisoners in exchange. Hamas has. Right, right. So, yes, Iran in this larger picture of the political geopolitical situation. Okay, so that's why you made reference earlier to this idea that the attempts to reduce brutality can make it worse, yes. right? Because when you change the rules, yes. you open up new strategic possibilities that are put in put in place in consequence of being able to manipulate the rules. Listen to his answer. And, and I want to say this because like, this is a, a very, very, very important uh, principle to grasp. Western culture, Western ideals, Western philosophy does not understand the mindset of the Middle East. They don't understand what's actually happening here and what's actually taking place. And this is such an important aspect to consider. You cannot think the same way that we think about things in the West. As a matter of fact, this is interesting. David and I did a, a discussion on this uh, several weeks back. Some people didn't like this discussion because it was a very uh, heated conversation. But, but the discussion centered around the fact that Israel's morality actually works against them. And when I say morality, I'm using David's words. I choose not to use those words. Um, Israel's uh, hesitance, for lack of a better term, because they don't want to do anything to anybody innocent, actually works against them. Because what happens is when people like Sinwar are sitting in jail and they're studying the tactics of Israel's IDF and they start thinking about, um, you know, the rules that Israel plays by, then they know this is all I have to do to manipulate this system to gain entry by doing this. And once I'm in, then they have to treat me a specific way and then I'm going to use that to my advantage 
to exploit you. That's what's going on. So it's like learning and understanding how things are done and then using that as a tool to be able to take a run at somebody. You, you, you think about it like this. If I am at war with somebody else and I know that the people that I'm fighting have a rule of engagement tool that tells them they're not allowed to shoot at me until I shoot at them first. Well, then my strategy is not going to be defensive. My strategy is going to be offensive. My strategy is going to be to be the first that comes to the gate and does the attacking because I know they can't attack me unless I do this first. So the more rules and the more things that Israel does in order to prevent civilian casualties, the more of an advantage I have as Israel's enemy because I can exploit their rules to do these things. It's kind of like the whole bunker buster, uh, you know, the, the the roof knock thing that they do where they just, they they drop a few little uh, uh, concussive type little ping, ping on the top of a roof so everybody understands that there's a bomb that's about to be dropped and they all run out. Well, these terrorists use this to their advantage. They make people stay in those buildings. They do all kinds of things because they know Israel's rules and they take those rules and they use Use them to their advantage. And that's what John Spencer is about to talk about right here. This is the Western, right, so, we call it the liberal, demo, the yeah. liberal dilemma. Yeah, right. And, right, and the right. enemies of Western societies have learned that you know, war is always a contest of will of three populations. The military's fighting, of course. The politicians who are ordering the militaries to fight, but their populations. Yeah. We lost the Vietnam War, not because of the field of battle, of course, because the American population said, we don't see the interest in this and the, the Cronkite effect. So the actual, that, that social media effect was there in the Vietnam sure, War. Sure, sure. So it's the, the contest of three, three, three wills that have, have led to this point, absolutely. And, but that weakness has also led to an aversion. So this is my, again, because I've been in this field with the United Nations and Human Rights Watch and Human Rights Groups who have risen in their vocal power to say, that's not okay, whatever it is. Right, and so now that's weaponized. That's why you have Gaza. Yeah. That's why you have 400 miles of tunnels underneath civilians. That's why you have every hospital serving as a military purpose. Mm -hmm. Tunnels Well, it's schools. also why the Iranian psy psyops agents, let's say, can twist the moral force of the West to their own advantage. That's right. why you have urban warfare. Okay, expand on that. If I, as we've been talking, if I'm a non-state actor or a great, my actual long strategy is to defeat you. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not trying to defeat you. I'm trying to turn your population against you. Mm -hmm. So I pull you into an urban area, show right. you photos of dead children. Right, right, right. And you will stop your, your, your government and force your government to do things that they don't even want. And this has been the, like an example, the, have you heard of the 2,000-pound bomb? Is it the bunker buster? Yeah. Yeah. Like how awful it is to use in urban warfare. This is really, really important because what he's explaining to each and every single one of us is that this is Gaza's tactic. Gaza's greatest weapon right now, Hamas's most powerful weapon, is probably the most sophisticated weapon in existence, and that is the manipulation of the human mind in pop culture through the induction, for lack of a better term, of the false stories that continue to brew to give people the wrong idea about what's going on. So the idea here is if I can stir the people up to get angry with their government, then their government will act on their behalf and make it difficult for my enemy government. Think about it like this, if I'm a Palestinian, and I specifically am a leader in Hamas, and I want to do the very best that I can to disrupt Israel's ability to do anything uh, that they want to do to keep me from attacking them any further, and I actually want to win. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find the most influential country in Israel's way. And that country, I'm going to literally figure out a way to propagandize my message to get all the people in that country upset so that they go to their leaders and put pressure on their leaders to put Israel to a stop. And that's what they're doing with the kids on the college campuses. They're doing exactly that. They are exposing the kids and getting the kids to do these very things. And by the way, I have proof of this. I can play this video for you time and time and time again where they say, uh, the leaders of Hamas are saying, well, we get the kids on campus to do this. We have no desire for a two-state solution. We want to destroy Israel. 
And they're going to do it by manipulating the government of the United States of America to get in Israel's face on their behalf because the people of the United States of America have been duped. Look at what he goes on to say. One of the, of the many criticisms against the IDF's operations in Gaza has been the use of bombs. Yeah. Matter of fact, there's a misnomer that if you bomb less, there'll be less civilian casualties. And we can talk about it if you want. But one of the biggest things, to include the U.S. administration, because of this belief of the use of one bomb called the 2,000-pound bomb, is that they've used so many of them that nobody else would have done that, that Israel is purposely trying to cause destruction. Mm, okay, yeah. It's, it's a sure. vilification of one. Right, right, right. That's an effective communication strategy, it right? Because it sounds monstrous, a 2,000 pound, pound bomb. And okay, I can see how that would work effectively. And then you found a bunch of human rights groups which can tell you how much, how what size the explosion is, how right. much concrete it. Then you find different people who say, well, we didn't use that many of those in the last 30 years, and Israel's used this many. We used over 5,000 two pound. 2,000 pound bombs in the one month of the invasion of Iraq. You know why? Because there were military complexes underneath buildings. Right, right, right. So, so you have to go deep. 5,000, folks. 5,000 in a month is what the United States of America used. And nobody said a thing. Why? because it's the context in how those bombs are used. If you're targeting something underground, you need a, a, a bunker buster. That's just how it works. But yet they're propagandizing the use of these tools. Look, I see these guys do it all the time. Like you could look at the Young Turks guy and look at these big bombs they're using and how terrible it is. They're killing Israel. Blah, blah, they're, Israel's killing Palestinians. Blah, blah. Wait. You don't understand the context. And even if you do, in some cases, these people are lying. They're being dishonest. They don't recognize it. The United States of America, in a one-month period, used 5,000 bunker busters in Iraq. Think about the significance of that statement for just a second. It's pretty heavy. A 2,000-pound bomb only goes 50 feet underground. A bunker buster. Right, right. And I just told you, right. I, I was in a 150 feet underground in a Hamas tunnel right. in December. But all the criticism of the 2,000-pound bomb and Israel's use against a combatant in underground structure says, you know, it's, it's just, you know, abhorrent that they would use this tool in war. Right. I think it puts U.S. national security at risk. So when next time when you send my brothers and sisters or our military into war, you're going to say that they can't use a 2,000-pound bomb against an enemy underneath certain buildings right. or in a bunker. Right, right. That's really where we're going, but it's the evolution of this hitting at the West, the liberal democracy or the liberal mm -hmm. dilemma mm -hmm. to say that you, you can find a different way. Yeah, yeah, got it. This okay, so so tell me, tell me what Israel is doing and has done. So they're fighting yeah. urban warfare. You said with a fifteen to one disadvantage yes. fundamentally. Now my understanding is that the IDF is doing what it can do to minimize non-combatant targets. Do you, do you believe that that's the case? Are I, they... I've written with evidence that Israel is doing more to prevent civilian casualties than any military has done in the history of war. Yeah, listen to that. More to prevent civilian casualties than any other military in the history of war. More to prevent civilian casualties than any other military in the history of war, yet Israel is being viewed as a bunch of careless, reckless warmongers. Why? Because of the propaganda. Because of the lies that are being communicated. Because the West does not understand that it's even viable that a group of leaders would use innocent civilians as their human shields. When I hold my precious son in my arms or my beautiful daughters or my amazing wife, I oftentimes obsess over how I can protect them. I love them. I care about them. One of the leaders of Hamas, the one who was just recently killed by Israel, Ishmael Haniya, threw a party when his children and grandchildren were killed. He called them martyrs. They call themselves the culture of death. They say that the problem with the United States of America and the problem with Israel is that they love life, but we love death. 
And that's why we're going to win. That's what they say. By the way, in Arabic, they're saying this. It's not hard. I could translate it for you very easily. These people find great joy. It almost gets them just in this weird place of stimulation and gratification to put innocent civilians as human targets, human shields. And by the way, let me just make myself clear. Many of these people that we call innocent civilians aren't so innocent. They're happy to be human shields. Ba'isma Allah, in the name of Allah, they are very happy because they want to destroy life. And if their own life is destroyed, they say, Allahu Akbar. Why not? If my life is destroyed, at least I took many lives with me. That's their thinking. It, 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 it's just senseless, you guys. It makes no sense. But that's the issue we're dealing with here. That's what we're contending with. Okay, okay, okay. So you think that's valid. So what sort of things do they do to, to, to make that a reality? Sure. And this is why I went back in February. Like, I wanted to see it uh, uh, for myself. Yeah. Like, not just the, what, the access to information everybody else has. I wanted to ask them, like, how are you doing this? Yeah. Um, given the complexity of a, a combatant who uses the human sacrifice Yeah, strategy, right. So the number one thing that people have done, although, again, I, the, the strategy to win wars is to do it rapidly. Right. So, uh, and is that also because opposition to the war mounts as sure. it, yeah, as it's protracted? Because war is politics. Right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So the more dragged out it is, the more dragged out a victory, the more costly it yeah. is on the public relations side. That's right. This is one of the strongest disagreements that I've had with uh, Netanyahu's administration. I think that they should have gone in hot and heavy into Gaza. They should have gone from the north to the south in days. They should have literally completely, I, I, even if they had to carpet bomb every single known tunnel, every single military. Listen, they would have had a whole lot less bombing the snot out of Gaza in the first few days than they are right now trying to do all of this stuff where they're trying to prevent all of these casualties because they're beginning to look like the monsters more and more and more and more. And over the next few days, the next three or four days after October 7th, they should have just completely wiped it, wiped the whole leadership of Hamas out. They could have done it. And yes, I understand they didn't want to lose the lives of their hostages. And there's a lot of nonsense, you know, that's been happening. But the, with every day that goes by, Israel becomes... The evil people, they're becoming darker and darker and darker to so many people. That's the sad part of this. I mean, the, the losers start to look like victims. Right. Or if they yeah. have, I mean, this is Ukraine had to hold for a while. It, it, it had to slow Russia down from achieving an overwhelming coup de main, which is overthrow the government and, and the fight's over. Right, right. So it's always to get in there and rapidly achieve your goals. Yeah. Uh, if you can slow the army down, then all these other political elements. Set. Sure. What Israel did, though, was implemented things to prevent civilian harm. After October 7th, they waited three weeks before they entered Gaza. Right. They did evacuation. That is the overwhelming number one thing that any military has ever done in the history of war to prevent civilian harm is evacuate cities. Although you— Well, and that's a very strange thing in this situation because yes. the city is the target. Uh, this was the misnomer, too, that I saw that Gaza is the densest place on Earth. I saw that on October 8th. And I study cities for a living. Like, mm -hmm. they're not even, it's not even the top 100. Mm -hmm. it, it, has, it, is, it has 10 massive cities, a total of 24 cities, um, that are very dense. But there's also, it's not one continuous urban area. But you are right that in any war I've studied, there's never been a population trapped in the combat area. Although in the 2016-17 Battle of Mosul, a city of a million, the Iraqi government told the civilians to stay in the city, yeah, 850,000 of them, to stay in the city during the battle because they didn't have a place for them to go. Eventually, they told them to get out. But because of Egypt, the Palestinian people of Gaza had nowhere to go. Right. So Israel— Can you explain that? Yep. Why did the Palestinians have no place to go because of Egypt? Listen to this. This is very, very heavy. Palestinian people did not have a place to go from Gaza because of Egypt, not Israel. Because of Egypt, not Israel. My mom and dad are born and raised in Egypt. So you would think if anybody had an interest to protect the reputation of Egypt, it's me. But let me just simply say this. Egypt was sound in their thinking. They were right to actually not facilitate that. Listen to this. And there's a long history there um, to include there's a city, Rafa, that used to be on both sides 
Uh, and, and that Egypt, that history escapes our campuses. Like yes, yeah, you might say that. Yeah, that, that Egypt ev- destroyed the homes of 100,000 people on their side and evacuated all those people because there were a bunch of smuggling tunnels going in between and terrorism on their side. Right. They don't want a radical, radicalized population. Right. So they don't want to bring in the Palestinian right, right, right. right. Their- well, it is the case if I've got this right that the Arab world in general has refused to take Palestinian refugees in any great numbers. Right. That, that is the case. 100%. And this is the reason, the reason that you just described. Depending on what nation you're talking about, absolutely. Some say it's because they don't want a forced displacement. So yeah. they, they use that as an excuse. But for Egypt, it's very clear. Okay. They share the border with Gaza. Okay. It would so, be very easy for them to open that side up of the Sinai, and, and these kids need to look on the map. I mean, where Egypt is in this giant desert of, called the Sinai, yeah. there makes it, it is not rational to say that Egypt couldn't have opened their side up, created a humanitarian zone outside of the combat area. It's just not rational. So where did the Palestinian refugees that Israel allowed to escape go? The official reason that many of these people give is we don't want to have anything to do with forced displacement, meaning we don't want to uh, bring in any of our resources uh, to manage an issue that we can avoid completely having to manage in the first place. That's, That's the first thing. But here's the thing that people are not talking about, but I'm talking about it, okay? You talk to any Egyptian who has any understanding of history and immediately they'll talk about Anwar Sadat, they'll talk about Islamic Brotherhood, and then they'll go back to the recent time during the Clinton administration in Shoeda Tahrir in, in, in Cairo when this big old massive United States State Department sponsored riot actually allowed Islamic Brotherhood to become the leaders in Egypt. And then when you start looking at al-Sisi and what he did, the current president of Egypt, removing, literally destroying the Islamic Brotherhood, pushing them out of the country, you'll understand why Egyptians don't want anybody from Islamic Brotherhood anywhere near them. And by the way, you say, James, why do you keep mentioning Islamic Brotherhood, Islamic Brotherhood? What do they have to do with Hamas? Hamas came from Islamic Brotherhood. They are the, the has, Islamic Brotherhood are the creators of Hamas. It's that simple. That's why Egypt is doing what they're doing. By the way, they don't want them in the Sinai. They don't want them in Lebanon. They don't don't want them anywhere. Nobody wants them anywhere. There's not a single Arab nation right now in the world that wants to take on Hamas or even, quite frankly, the Palestinian population. You would say, well, James, what what about Iran? What about southern Iraq? I mean, uh, they would seem to be sympathetic towards uh, Hamas. They're sympathetic towards Hamas as long as Hamas stays in Gaza because Hamas becomes a proxy for them and that proxy minimizes the loss of their greatest proxy to the north, which of course is going to be Hezbollah, who's slowly inching up towards Beirut, and of course to the south, which are the Houthis in Yemen. They've already got their hands tied to the south, which is uh, really, if you think about it, it's Iran's west, but the the south of the Arabian Peninsula or the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula. And then, of course, you have Lebanon, which is the, the, the crown jewel. It's the apple of Iran's eye, Hezbollah. Iran fights through proxies. They don't engage themselves. When they do, most of the time, they get their butts kicked. It's an important thing to understand here. So nobody wants anything to do with the Palestinian population. Go ask the King of Jordan. Look at what the King of Jordan did in one day. Look up, Black September. Just go look that up. It's a very, very powerful picture. And by the way, if you don't feel comfortable typing in Black September, just type in Jordanian Civil War. You'll learn everything there is to know about all this nonsense. It's unbelievable, folks. Look, This thing with this dynamic of them not wanting Islamic Brotherhood anywhere near also plays into the massive division that exists between the world's majority of Muslims, which of course are the Sunni, versus the minority of Muslims, which are the Shiites. The Shiites, of course, being represented by Iran, uh, Azerbaijan, a few of these other countries. But understand, the majority, they're Sunnis. And there's a lot that has to come into play with all of this. And I'm going to tell you this right now. The black sheep of the Sunni world is Hamas and Islamic Brotherhood. Just understand that. They're nothing but a pain in the rear to these people. We have to note this. It's critical. 
they went to a place that Israel established, and nobody has asked this question, like, why did Israel create the al Mawasi humanitarian zone on the southwestern edge of Gaza? Because yeah, right, it, I haven't even heard of that. Yeah, that's the, the giant over a million people humanitarian tent zone that Israel designated in October for all the displaced people to go. Demilitarized, by the way. Demilitarized safety area for everybody. They're getting fed. It's it's quite a comfortable situation. Ah, no, no, that's not true. Look at all the women. It is. It is. Just go look. Just take some time to examine the truth about this. Because it's the one area they knew Hamas did not have immense defensive positions set up. Like I, tunnels. I see, I see, I see. So how did Israel ensure that when all the refugees went to this zone that hadn't been militarized, let's say, by Hamas, that it wouldn't just be as infiltrated by Hamas as Gaza itself is. Like, so how do they know that the refugees are refugees and not military combatants? How? Great. It, it's a I mean, good question. I know you have the, some of them identified, but yep. okay. It's a good question. So initially, little control. So yeah, right. This, okay. This is where, it was quick. Yeah. Um, Israel did move forward and split Gaza in half along the, what's called the Wadi Gaza. This is a river that splits Gaza almost in half. I mean, it's, it's, it's 25 miles, but they split in half. 850,000, which is actually an effective metric of ev evacuations. By the way, this river is, is uh, really, um, really unique. Um, we'll put it up on the map that shows you how it actually splits Gaza. And I mean, it's straight almost in half. And as you look at this, you'll recognize why this would be perfect military strategy for Israel. The only thing that made it imperfect was they didn't act fast enough. They should have acted a lot faster. There's a lot of woulda, shoulda, couldas here, but there's some operational considerations that probably needed to be made that weren't made. And uh, the political pressure is what did most of the damage. Joe Biden ruined a lot of this stuff, guys. He did. So the world said you can't do it. I don't know if you remember that. When Israel announced evacuations to protect civilian life before they moved in to get their hostages and destroy Hamas, the world said you can't do that. You can't evacuate a million people. And that literally was the statement from the United Nations and others. You mm -hmm. can't do that. Mm -hmm. Israel did it and mm -hmm. successfully evacuated 850,000 below that. But you're right. Many Hamas leadership and hostages were moved during that time. As Israel was allowing for the protection of civilians, rather than, like other militaries, invading a territory, do it with overwhelming force to achieve your right. goals quickly. Quickly. Right, quickly. right, right. And so they took the risk of the hit on the public relations side. And I want you, I just want you to imagine what that looks like. The United Nations, which in my opinion is one of the largest terrorist organizations in the world, if not the largest, the United Nations basically says, you cannot evacuate people and put them in the safety zone. You just can't do it. So then let's say Israel doesn't do it. Let's say they, they, they did it, which they did, but let's say they don't. Then you go bomb those areas and, and all these people die. So Israel is literally damned by the international community if they do and damned if they don't. You understand the satanic ploy here? And it's amazing to me when you think about the UN because the UN's organization, UNRWA, were complicit in the terrorist attacks on October the 7th. And you wonder why the UN is so anti-Semitic? They were part of the original attacks. Because they know from their own history that they have to keep international will, even after yeah. October 7th. yeah. International will and the United States, who started making recommendations on day one of what Israel could or couldn't do. You're right. Like right. The, Israel wanted to go in with a larger force, and, and there was rec, you know discussions at the political level. All war is politics. You can't go in with five divisions. You have to use four divisions. And now we're in Rafa. You can't go in with two divisions. You got to go in with one division. That's what you saw. But Israel learned. So Israel did. By the time I visited in, in Khan Yunus, interesting as we go through all the metrics and all the things that Israel has done that no military has done in history, I, am, I went in with the division commander who talked to me about basically the political atmosphere was that you had to bring the civilian casualties to zero. There's literally what the statements were, which would mean the war needs to stop. Mm -hmm. So you had a division in Gaza, in Khan Yunus, which is a, another Hamas strong point, doing operations with the overwhelming backdrop of you can't have to have a civilian casualty. So they did what, an example of how they prevented that, basically the migration of Hamas, although it's still inaccurate to say that that migration is not showing Israel is successful. 
because dismantling the military means taking away its military capability. Mm-hmm. So Hamas wasn't moving with its 20,000 rockets. Right. It wasn't moving with its deep buried military weapons production plants. Yeah, okay. In all its weapons supplies. So you still got to get in there and clear that and discover it. And this is why- So at least they're disarmed. That's right. Even if they're there. Yeah. There's okay. still going to be tens of thousands of okay. radicalized who people. Did, who didn't go- along with the evacuation on the Palestinian side because they had the option. So now the simple-minded yep. consequence of what you said, my understanding of that would be that, well, Israel gave the civilian population ample time to clear out, Three and weeks. many people did. Yep. Okay, so now if Israel goes into um, into Hamas territory, yep. into the Gaza, and there are civilians there that are being killed, who, like those are people who didn't leave or couldn't leave. Okay, so... Or, or, or yeah, or, or, or forced not to leave. Hamas okay. also didn't allow their own population to leave. How, how much of their own population? It's hard to measure. A, a, any approximation? I mean, a, there are 850,000 that did evacuate. So yeah. It leaves, you know, 250,000 or 150,000 still there. Okay, those, okay, 150,000 the still there. still there. Right. Who, but... This is, again, because I've studied every urban battle that's ever happened. There's always about 10% that stay. So, so you're talking about at the bare minimum, 20%. Heck, let's just be generous. And let's say at the bare minimum, 10%. Hamas, on purpose, required that much of their population stay in that zone as a sacrifice to die so that they could manipulate the New York Times and the whole media world to get the result that they want so they can achieve victory. That is how wicked and evil and satanic and demonic these people are. That's what, what's going on. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay, a, so that's not, that's not, not, not historically not, abnormal. But it how is did Hamas abnormal pr- for Hamas to set up checkpoints. Um, to, to not let people to go. To not let people go, to shoot at people trying to leave to fire from the humanitarian safe route. So this is standard too. You yeah. evacuate the cities, create the road that yeah. you want them to use. Hamas would put rockets next to that so they could use media to say Israel is striking the zones that they told people to, to leave. That's a fact. That's how. Right. Right. I see. Okay. So there's 150,000 people left. Okay. So then Israel moves in. Yep. Okay. So, so they've got rockets in positions that Israel is not currently in, but right next to these zones where these people are supposed to be evacuating so that they can fire rockets into the safety zones that are made for these innocent Palestinians so that when they die, they can be accused, Israel can be accused of killing them with bombs. By the way, they tried to do that in a hospital, if you remember. And um, there were some people that had died, but we actually had the evidence to prove very quickly that it was Hamas that launched the rocket. And they do that kind of stuff on purpose, folks. They do it all the time. What, what do they, how do you move in? What does that look like? Building by building fighting? Like, what, what does that look like? What's that like for the people who are on the ground? Yeah, it starts with, like any military would, striking known military locations. Okay, so that's airstrikes, airstrikes. fundamentally. That's, okay, okay. That's like that's standard military operation to include in urban warfare. If you know there's an enemy bunker or an enemy headquarters or an enemy formation, you would always want to strike them as far as ways you can, especially if yeah. you've done everything to move civilians out of harm's way right. possible. Right, right. This is the ideal, like the 2,000 pound bomb you can't use in an urban area, which they're actually saying doesn't matter if there's zero civilians there. You can't use that bomb. Oh, or- right. Okay. Well, that's obviously a propaganda maneuver. So, okay. So, so one advantage of clearing the civilians out then would be that there would be, in principle, fewer restrictions on your ability to use air power. So why doesn't, why don't the Hamas forces just move everything that they have into the tunnels? I imagine they did that to some degree. This is why they have 400 miles of tunnels. Right, right. Uh, so why have anything available to be bombed? So this is what I faced. When I went there in December and interviewed brigade commanders that were fighting there, they would have a two-week battle on a single block yeah. because Hamas wasn't in the buildings. They were underneath, running in a— Right. In li- 400 miles in a stretch of only— There are layers in, and webs of tunnels underneath at varying depths. It, it was it's so hard to imagine. I've never studied that. We call it the three-dimensional war, but uh-huh. to, to know— I, 
so this is a funny thing about me going into Khan Yunus. Uh, I was in Khan Yunus, a lot less activity, but I was taken to a location where they were searching for a tunnel. And, and later that they found that tunnel, I was standing on top of an uncleared Hamas tunnel mm-hmm. on the surface. Mm-hmm. And that's what the IDF faced every moment, every step they took into Gaza. And then the houses were I, you know, basically rigged to blow. There were absolutely mm-hmm. Hamas left behind. And this is why northern Gaza was chosen first. It was the military strong point of Hamas, of its battalions with assigned geographic areas to hold with a vast tunnel network of caches all throughout the urban train. Same thing that you would teach somebody to do. If okay, so this whole tunnel network, it was produced over what period of time? At least 15 years. 15 years. And but so there were some present already when the ID, while the IDF were there before they gave up. Gaza and gave it to okay. the Palestinian people. So, and I want to say this because these tunnels are brutal. The, it, the last time there was a massive uh, skirmish in the north, when you're talking about Hezbollah, you might remember this. This was probably around five years ago or so, maybe a little bit longer than it. Actually, come to think about it, closer to eight years. We lost a lot of kids in the IDF. And what were those kids lost doing? They were lost going into these tunnels that were in southern Lebanon. Uh, seeking to remove the threats to innocent civilians that were there in southern Lebanon, the Arabs that are there in southern Lebanon, and they gave their lives defending these civilians. It's amazing when you think about it. They're not the people that are the aggressors. And if you think about this, these people have been given billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars to provide food for their people, to give them uh, uh, schools and uh, uh, clean living facilities and so on and so forth. And they've taken all that money and they've built these tunnels underground. Guys, 400 miles of tunnels. 400 miles. You could get a part. You Look, with 400 miles, you could easily build tunnels that will connect you from one end of a state to another. It's that crazy. And all these tunnels are loaded with military-grade weapons. Think about that. Designed to take human life. Think about this, folks. It, it was obviously prepared under the assumption that Israel would eventually move in. Yes. Okay. But it and- wasn't for the purpose, again, their defensive tactics. So they spent 15 years, which is unique in urban warfare, to prepare their terrain for solely military defense, but not to, because defenders usually lose. All they had to do was hold the IDF long enough for the international community right. in the United States. To, to turn. To turn them Yeah, on. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. okay. So that dictated and they the knew tactics. That. Absolutely. It's been the strategy. The okay, tunnels, okay. I wrote this article, you know, war is a contest of politics, but I wrote the article in like November, like the. This is the first war I've studied where the underground is more important than the surface. Right, right. Because the, the Hamas are in the tunnels. The hostages are in the tunnels. The tunnels are the key methodology sure. to achieve the strategy. Sure, of sure, it, sure. Well, how effective has been, how effective has be, has is Israel's invasion of Gaza been then if the Hamas terrorists can just retreat to the tunnels? And have, have all the tunnels been identified it or does anyone even know that yeah well since they knew since the the and i study underground warfare as well i was doing underground warfare conferences in israel in 2018 in hezbollah tunnels and hamas tunnels um no they don't they don't even know how many tunnels are there. yeah right now the estimate went from 300 miles to 400 miles but they found tunnels that they couldn't have imagined just the size of them the depth of them how effective had they been at finding and destroying yeah right is it possible to destroy them all right but if they're so dug underneath every structure in Gaza, they're not going to destroy them all. They've had to make critical decisions on which ones to destroy. And there's not enough explosive in the world. to de- So they've made really tough decisions mm-hmm. on which ones they find to destroy and how to destroy it. And, and by the way, you have to understand, there, it's, a, it's a much bigger issue than what uh, John Spencer is bringing up. Because here's the problem. If you destroy all these tunnels that are dug under these uh, buildings— Look, these tunnels are not just a bunch of uh, monkeys that are digging underground that are going, oh, oh, ah, give me my banana, okay? These people, these uh, Hamas members, these Palestinians, there's some 
just incredibly smart people that are engineering these tunnels. These tunnels are dug in a very specific way that provides immense amount of structural support. They act as alternative foundations. And the idea behind it is if those tunnels get destroyed, then you destroy all the infrastructure that's built on top of the tunnels. That's why the biggest and most important tunnels are built under hospitals and schools and uh, mosques and uh, that type of thing. There's a reason why they do that. And Israel finds himself in a very, very difficult uh, situation. And then, you know, you ask the question, well, can't, why can't they just fill it all up with cement? Okay, fine. Great idea. When you have the tunnel one tunnel that's a mile long that in a, a small city could fit in. How do you fill that with cement? H how does that even work? And what are the engineering implications of doing something like that? Well, the, there's so much. The, the, the implications of how it can dramatically affect the environment alone is a staggering issue. It's almost impossible. Mainly because they, they tried this flooding thing for a little while, yeah, which it didn't work. Mm. I thought it was a really innovative attempt. It actually worked for Egypt along the Egypt Gaza border to flood the tunnels because they were made of sand and they kind of collapsed down. Oh yeah, but these are billions of dollars, Jordan, used that would have gone to the Palestinian people. Right, billions of dollars to use to build these, and that's aid money. Yeah, well, and money that they take from you know they basically um, the market that they drive up the prices, and Hamas takes that money. So both direct aid money given to Hamas, but also Hamas's subjugation of its population into poverty involves the population having what to What about pay funding Hamas. from places like Iran, the direct funding for the construction of the tunnels? Is that also part of the strategy? Absolutely. But Iran has helped in many ways. Yeah. Uh, but again, what... And what, what do you make of, of the knowledge of the international community, let's say the UN, for example, with regard to the presence of these tunnels? I mean, how much of the fact that these tunnels existed has come... Who has it come as a surprise to and who knew? So this is an important one. Listen to, to his answer here because I like Jordan Peterson answering this or asking this question because he's basically going to outline the fact that... Um, the United Nations was complicit in all of this. They knew about all of this. They, of course, they knew about all of this. And they went out of their way to defend the position of Hamas in uh, how they've handled all of this. It's very, very sad, but it's, it's, it's a reality. So this is the, the idea of who is the United Nations. Yeah, there, there's a good question. Or who is UNRWA, the yeah. United Nations organization in, in the Palestinian areas, right? So in Gaza, the UN voice in Gaza is UNRWA. So we're rational people that like have facts and can make deductions off facts. If there are Hamas data centers underneath UNRWA headquarters, or if there's Hamas tunnels underneath UNRWA facilities, schools, mosques, hospitals, but UNRWA, who has been there for 15 years, says that we did not know about that. Mm -hmm. To me, that doesn't make logical sense. Well, it's either a confession of incompetence or malevolence. It's one of the two. Because how could you not know? It, it, it's just a lie. I mean, of course you knew. Um, this gets the idea of where do we get information from Gaza. Yeah. So Hamas is the ruling power, has been the ruling power for 15 years. And you can't work in Gaza, much like the Ba'ath regime in Iraq, unless you're a member of Hamas. Mm -hmm. And you could not be like a radicalized, martyr, you know, fundamentalist Hamas. But you can bet your dollar you can't say anything without the threat to your life if you don't even believe in the ideology. This mm -hmm. gets to our number of civilian casualties, mm -hmm. like the Gaza Health Ministry, which is the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry, and that we will believe their word yeah. without even questioning to where we have the national leaders of the world parroting the number, which I tell you as a scholar of this, there is no number. Like, there's no way to know how many civilians have, are dying on a daily basis down to the single digit, period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or that nobody will acknowledge that the Gaza Health Ministry provides a number to the world that, according to them, includes every death that happens in Gaza, no matter the cause. Right, right, right. So it doesn't right. matter if it was a Hamas rocket that landed on a house, since 20% of the 13,000 rockets Hamas has, has fired have landed in Gaza. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter if that death was caused by Hamas. And the Hamas number also includes any reported missing person, whether it's a social media post or a family member saying, I don't know where this person is. 
that goes on Hamas's list of dead personnel. Mm-hmm. But the world just runs with three, 37,000 Palestinian. Right. And I've seen that number radically adjusted multiple times, which is an indication of its, well, of its comparative reliability. But this gets to the college kids that. Yeah. Like, by the way, I, I want to say this before he responds to what Jordan said about this. The reliability variable that exists here is almost non-existent. What you have to understand is these numbers are very, 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 very wrong. The United Nations finally came out and said, yeah, we don't really know what the numbers are. And what we gave you are, are, are completely exaggerated when a researcher who understands statistics came out and said, no, wait, hold on. There's no way you can have those many children die that Hamas claims have died because what accompanies children are mothers and what accompanies children are fathers. And we don't see the same type of matching that you would expect to see uh, in casualties when you claim so many children die. Like, for example, you know, if you if you say that a certain amount of children die, then you would expect to see a certain amount of parents die with them. Because for every few children, you'll see a parent, you'll see a mother. And so none of those numbers made sense. And every kind of creative statistical analysis that can be done went back to the same thing. And that is the numbers are wrong. They're not just exaggerated. They're just completely made up. So we don't even know what the real numbers are. That's pro- perhaps the saddest and most difficult thing to be able to swallow here because all of these lies are being used to seek to destroy the people of Israel. Just know what the number is. The number is every death that's happened to Gaza, no matter the cause. You know, I've had some friends who've been looking at the social media warfare end of this who are trying to understand what information the college kids who are protesting are getting and why they believe it. And TikTok in particular is flooded with images that suggest that the IDF are barbarians beyond belief and that the casualty rates are extremely high. And once you click on one of those, then that's all you get in your feed. And that seems to be particularly effective. The use of imagery of injured children, for example, seems to be particularly effective for women. And of course, the majority of the protesters on the Ivy League campuses are women. And so they're the targets of this particular PSYOP. And so that's another... It's a dream for Russia. Right. Listen to what he says about it being a dream for Russia. And listen to what he says about how the algorithm of TikTok deeply favors terrorist activity in Israel. Listen to this. To have this yeah. access to the youth's minds. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's Russia, it, China, and Iran. It's right. a dream that they have this access in an algorithm yeah. that feeds it. Like, yeah, you don't yeah. have to do the work. Yeah, right. The algorithm absolutely. feeds it. There's yeah. actually a battle in my work in, in urban warfare history where the United States was defeated because of this. The first battle of Fallujah, I don't know if you remember that, but there were four American contractors that were killed in the city of Fallujah in April of 2004. The U.S. president ordered, because they dismembered American citizens, uh, burned them all and hung them from the bridge. US, oh, yes. Yep. Um, remember that? Yeah. The U.S. president ordered the Marines to go in and get those responsible for that action. So the, the Marine Corps, over their objections, launched an operation. Al Jazeera was sitting in the hospital airing photos of children that had been casualties of the operations and trumping up numbers of civilian casualties, unverifiable. Mm-hmm. And six days into the battle, the Iraqi governing council, the U.S. allies all threatened to disband if the United States didn't stop its battle. That was a, a, a basically an echo to what we have today, uh-huh. where you can defeat a superior power easily through the use of information warfare, the pictures of children. Like, why did those resonate? I know that's your field of study. Like, that resonates very strongly to include me. Yeah, of course. I don't want to, I have children. I don't want to see any children. I've seen children, and this again goes back to the, even these kids won't acknowledge what Hamas is. When I well, watch- children are the ultimate victims, yeah. right? The ultimate innocent victims. And so if you're playing a victim victimizer ideological game, then obviously pictures of hurt children are effect- incredibly effective weapons in that regard. And of course, if there is a war, there's going to be hurt children. So it's, it's a strategy that's very difficult to counter. That's for sure. But there's an ideology that the IDF would do it purposely. When... I can show you the video of October 7th where Hamas psychopaths, like it's yeah. like Jeffrey Dahmer's, yeah. were standing over m- children making a death moan and laughing over top of them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I watch those videos. <sighs> I, 
it, it, it's it's really really hard not to get just completely angry. When when I watch those videos, I I was there because the state of Israel gave me an invitation to go watch, and um, the only reason why I went to go watch was because it was really important to David to go with me and to go see him. The, the part that I hated the most about those videos was the fact that I could speak Arabic and I could understand what they were saying. Because I wouldn't even call these people animals. They're demonic barbarians. The way that they chanted, the joy that came out of their deep, dark, satanically inspired, evil, demonically possessed mouths. You could see the horror on the faces of these kids. You could see how scared these kids were when they were begging for their lives and how happy these Hamas animals were. Barbarians, savages. Ugh. The, the most sophisticated weapon that sits in the hands of these terrorists right now are United States college students. Um, TikTok, Instagram, the New York Times. It, it's, it's the most sophisticated weapon in existence right now in warfare. I've been in war and seen children injured. And every individual, doesn't matter who he was, is dying in their heart to help that, per right. that child. So the idea that the IDF would purposely harm a child isn't backed up by evidence. Mm -hmm. Now, do civilians get caught in between two warring factions? Yes. But despite going back to our statement that the IDF have done everything anybody's ever thought of and created ways that nobody's ever thought of. I mean, they have drones with speakers, going back to drones, that go into enemy-held territory and announce to the civilian, please leave. This is a combat area. They've used technologies to track every cell phone in an area now, whether it's on or off, to know if there's civilians there, and they won't even allow their military into that area until a certain population gets out. Now, let's skip over to where Jordan asks a question about where are the leaders of Hamas? Listen to this. And by the way, this was before the execution of Ismail Haniya. That's before his assassination. But, but listen to how he answers this because this will also make you sick. Like this will get you livid. It will get you angry. Listen to this question. Where are the Hamas leadership located? Physically, where so, are they? Southern Gaza. Okay. And how successful has... We're in Gaza, right? Because it goes back to the cognitive. If maybe some of them have escaped, but like going back to even the good guys, like Zelensky, if he would have left, th that is less of a victory than if you stay. So I believe mm -hmm. that that leadership is still in Gaza. Okay. And do you have any sense of what proportion of the Gaza hierarchical leadership is still intact? I think that was a senior leadership. Uh, they've gotten one of the senior, senior leadership. Yeah. But this goes back to like when you hear... How many, how many of those people in leadership positions are crucial? Do, uh, Five what? or six. Okay, okay. So it's a, it's a, very, it's a handful of people. Yeah. I mean, if Yahya Sinwar survives this war, he's achieved victory. They'll make statues out of him. Mm -hmm. He will be the great terrorist that weakened Israel on the global international stage and struck mm -hmm. at United States' credibility. They, the, Iran will make statues of Yahya Sinwar if he survives this war. Uh -huh. He will be the great victor of this war. And let, let alone if October 7th becomes Palestinian Independence Day. Right. If the world says, we don't care, Palis it, everybody agrees Palestine is a state. Right, agrees. right. That's profound. Because they will call it Palestinian Independence Day. They will. Imagine a country or a nation who says that their Independence Day was a day that they went in and raped and killed and savagely burned and decapitated children. That's an Independence Day. No, that's your bondage day. That's the day that you solidified hell in your future. How many countries? There's European countries that have already um, accepted it as a state, eh? At least Spain, uh, yeah, Spain, Norway. I don't remember all the countries, but... yeah. It would be, it, if you, like, it's almost anti-intellectual. How do you not understand that if October 7th leads nope. to a, a creation of something, yep. despite all the challenges, 
it would lead to greater violence. Mm -hmm. No all. logic gets in the way of virtue signaling ever, True. right? There's no hypocrisy like moral hypocrisy. Yeah. This yeah. is where I can't tell you who's going to win this war. I can't. If okay. Israel is stopped because of real pressure, because yeah. like the weapons shipments that have been threatened to be withheld, yeah. Yeah. that has nothing to do with the operations in Gaza. That has to do with 100,000 Hezbollah attacking in the north. Northern Israel is currently under fire as we're speaking. Yeah. Because Hezbollah has been attacking. And the real threat is that you won't have the supplies to push them back. Because yeah. southern Lebanon is called— how, the, how serious is the situation in northern Israel with regards to Hezbollah right now? It's an like, existential threat. You don't get more serious than that. There are 80,000 Israelis who can't go home for the last eight months at a huge financial cost to the nation of Israel. But they're literally now trying to burn it all down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's an existential threat, which I think— People just discount, like, yeah, it's yeah. a threat. And you think that they'll just stop if if Israel stops in Gaza? You think they never want to underestimate the depth of anti-Semitism. The, the biggest problem has always been uh, never Gaza. It's never been Hamas. The biggest problem has always been Hezbollah to the north because they're the most savage. But the bigger problem, the one that's even more significant, is the one that Jordan Peterson's about to mention, and that's the subject of anti-Semitism. Now, we're going to listen to this last section here, and then I've got some things I want to say, and, and we'll wrap this up. But hopefully this has been very eye-opening for you guys. Listen to what, what is said here. Sure. And right. you, you have to believe, since none of this makes logic, that there is something else behind this, mm. all of this. Mm. And, and it, Insane jealousy of the successful minority, of the perennially successful minority. And then underneath that, what would you say? Why are the Jews the canary in the coal mine? because they're the perennially successful minority, okay? The successful in any enterprise are always a minority. So when a culture goes after the Jews, it's one step away from going after the successful themselves. And when a culture goes after the successful themselves, then it's doomed. Absolutely love and admire Jordan Peterson. I love his intellect, and I love the capacity that he has to be able to process all kinds of things related to human behavior, but let me tell you something. I have a fundamental disagreement with him on why the Jews are the canary in the coal mine. We're going to explain that in just a second because it's a much bigger and a much more significant issue. And John Spencer was implying it. I think that um, Jordan Peterson is at the cultural Christian stage, so he's beginning to see it a little bit. But the reason here is that it's spiritual. It's very spiritual for a very specific reason we're going to get into in just one second. Yeah. Right, is and so and then you might say, well, why would people go after the successful? It's like... Well, that's a story as old as time. That's the story of Cain, right? The first two human beings in the biblical account are Cain and Abel. And Cain is murderously resentful and bitter of success, right? And that makes him murderous. It makes him a rebel against God and makes his descendants genocidal. Yeah, what do you right? think? Right, well, that's, that's exactly. Nothing has changed. No, so I mean, this is why the reasons people go to war hasn't changed since ancient times. And why do you... Of the many reasons. Well, we there. also think that people go to war to win. True. Right. Yeah, no, no. The people who are really serious about going to war are perfectly happy to lose. So as long as the loss comes at sufficient cost. So actually dealing with an enemy whose desire is to win, that's a pretty easy battle. Yes. It's the people whose desire is to burn everything to ground and dance in the ashes. Those are the people that are... Very, very difficult to defeat. And that is precisely who Hamas is. That's the Islamic world. We don't care if we win. We win when we take everybody else out with us. We win when we become martyrs. That's their thinking. Because that's the devil's thinking. Think about it like this. The devil knows that he's going to be defeated. The devil knows that he's going to burn in the lake of fire forever. So for him, the goal is not to win per se. The goal is for him to take as many with him as he can. That's how the devil works, folks. It's a profound profound thing to think about. It all goes back to satanic inspiration. That spirit is alive in those campus protests, for sure. The protests of the radicals, they would burn everything to the ground. And this is why this is not, this idea that this is some type of an Israel-Palestine issue, that it's some type of an Israel-Arab world mm -hmm. issue. Now, the Arab world has addressed terrorism successfully in many parts of the Arab world their way mm -hmm. there you're actually per perpetuating the violence believing that you could just do something and it would all stop 
Mm -hmm. that's, that's not that's not the reality of, of truth. And I agree with you. Why, I mean, the one factor that college kids don't want to acknowledge is that there are two million Arab Israelis living side by side in Israel. Yeah, today. right. Th yes, that, that, that like oh, they don't care, and they're and they're not trying to to emigrate. One of the richest men in Israel is an Arab who owns the largest bank in Israel. I'll give you some perspective. As good for them as they would better for them than they would be anywhere else in the Arab world, with the possible exception of the UAE? Maybe. Maybe. Um, I mean, the Houthis in Saudi Arabia, there are issues, there, I mean, it's not every, it's not all good, of course. Okay. I think it's a good spot for us to stop because he's going to talk a little bit about the normalization agreements, the Abraham Accords, and then he gets in other, a few other subjects, but um, just to keep it, contained to the subjects that we're dealing with here, there's a few things I want to mention. The first thing is, is something that I talk about all the time, and that's the fact that when God made a covenant with Abraham and he established a nation of Israel, he did that to be a model and an example to the rest of the world. We know that. We find it everywhere in the Bible. The devil hates Israel because the devil hates God, and Israel is God's ancestrally chosen people. So as we all know, the devil hates anything and anyone who chooses to be affiliated with God or God chooses to be affiliated with them. It's, it's, it's that simple. And that's why right now in these last days, we're seeing more and more persecution of Christians. That's why in these last days, we're seeing the persecution of Jews because the Bible actually says that was gonna be the case. If all of these reasonings were not enough, how about we just simply talk about the fact that this is spiritual and that the devil it, this is his world, and these college students that are embracing this nonsense are embracing all of this evil because that is the world they live in. They live in the devil's world. According to the book Revelation, we know this. Eventually, the title deed to the earth, which was, by the way, given away by Adam when he chose to sin against God, will be reclaimed by the Lord Jesus Christ one day. But right now, this is the devil's world. And by the way, this is why it's really important for us to understand Bible prophecy because when you sit down and you listen to something like this, it makes you so overwhelmed like, man, there's no hope. How does this get fixed? Well, if you study Bible prophecy and you look at passages like Amos, then you'll recognize very, very quickly that Israel will never be removed from their land when God restores them back. When you read passages like Ezekiel 37, when you look at what the, the Bible has to say about Israel, when you recognize God's covenant is irrevocable, when you look in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah on behalf of the Lord says, look at the sun, the moon, and the stars. Look around. If those ordinances still exist, so will my people Israel. So if you are a member of Hamas, if you're a member of Hezbollah, if you're part of the, the, the Iranian uh, Shiite, a death cult, it doesn't matter who you are. You could be the Yemenis in the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula. It doesn't matter. If you aim your target at Israel, you lose and you'll be cursed by God. It's that simple. But the reason why this is happening is because God chose these people. God is hated by the one who has the title deed in this earth right now, and he's doing everything he can to take everybody with him. It's a spiritual issue. Look at what the Bible says about what's going to happen in the last days. This is verse 1 of Zechariah chapter 12. I read it all the time to you guys. It says this, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Yeah, God, he's the one that forms the spirit of man within us. Behold, I will make Jerusalem, what? A cup of trembling unto all people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Uh, think about this. Jerusalem is going to be literally a cup of drunkenness. It, 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 it's going to just completely cause people to be so profoundly inebriated. The center of it all. Anti-Semitism will be this inebriating variable that just tears apart society and destroys the world. Verse three, look at this. And in that day, notice this, will I make Jerusalem what? A burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So the Bible tells us 
The whole world is going to turn against Israel. Looks like that's what's happening right now. We are beginning to see the stage being set for the fulfillment, the complete fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 12. Folks, the whole world is gathering against Israel. There's a stunning mindset that exists right now within the church. Somehow, somewhere, I don't even know if they're the church, that says that Israel has no position with respect to God in the last days. That the church is the spiritual version of Israel. I even heard a guy who is so unbelievably ignorant of the word. He, he, he believes he's a pastor. He's not called by God, that's for sure. Who basically said that Israel as a land belongs to Jesus Christ and nobody else. Doesn't belong to the Jews, it just belongs to Jesus Christ. Okay, well, <laughs> I have so many problems with that statement. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, all right? God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Let's not even get into the ridiculously just insane, uninformed statement that was just made there. The land of Israel was promised to the Jews, and it belongs to them. As a matter of fact, later on when we get into the book of Revelation, at the end of Revelation, we learn about the new heaven and the new earth. We learn about the new city that we are all going to live in. And the very gatekeepers and the very foundation of that city has blended within it the 12 tribes of Israel as well as the church. The 12 tribes of Israel were the gateway to even be able to get into the city. You could never even get this if it wasn't for the Jews. Why in the world is this happening? I'll tell you why. Because the devil hates God and the devil hates God's people. Folks, more than ever in this time of day and in this time that we're living, we must stand with Israel. We must stand with Israel. Why? Because standing with Israel is standing with God. And standing with God is standing with Israel. And if you want God to bless your family, you want God to bless your children, you want God to bless your life, then you bless the children of Israel. If you want it all to be cursed, well, go curse the children of Israel, but I'm begging you not to do it. Genesis 12, 3, look what it says. It's obvious. It's right there. I, I Guys, the, the, the thing with Genesis is I read this so much that I'm almost, like I'm almost tired of reading it. I read it all the time. I'm not tired. I'll never get tired of reading it. But look at this. This is what he tells Abraham. Starting in verse one. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and I will make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. Look, Lord, he goes on to say, he says, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And look at the last part of this. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Are you part of one of all of the families of the earth? Oh yeah. We got to think about this correctly, folks. We got to follow the word of God and be unapologetic about it. I love this interview because this interview sheds a lot of light on what's really happening in Israel. And more than ever, the most important aspect of this is the spiritual aspect. So I would beg you to study Bible prophecy, to learn more about this, folks. I have done a lot of videos. As a matter of fact, I will put up a playlist for you that I have put together that is actually entitled Special prophecy Bible study. And this is right now we've had 10 or 11 of these that we've already done over the last few months where every Thursday I'm teaching a Bible study that directly relates to the time and day that we're living and Bible prophecy. And I want you to go through this stuff. It's a great starting place. And then go to jameskadis.com. You can go on this channel. You can go on the Calvary Chapel Signal Hill channel. I've got all the Bible studies. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm just about getting ready to wrap up the book of Revelation, which has been a really great study. I've got every book of the Bible. Go through all the minor prophets. Go to the major prophets. Go to the book of Revelation and get a biblical education. I promise you. I promise you it will be life-changing. Learning Bible prophecy understanding what awaits for you in the future will dramatically change the way you live in the present. So that's what it's all about. Let's take a moment and pray for Israel right now, and then we'll wrap it up. Father, we pray for the nation of Israel. We pray, God, that you would keep your people safe. 
Lord, as we're instructed to do in the Bible, we pray, God, for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray, Lord, for the preservation of your people. We pray for the preservation of Israel. And Lord, yes, we do pray, God, for the Palestinian population who put their faith and trust in wickedness and evil, that they would come to fall in love with you after you first loved them. May they come to know the true and living God. May they learn to worship Yeshua instead of Allah. We just pray, God, for the strength that only you can give us to stand for the things that are right. We love you. We thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.